November 10, 2015, at the police station, and he gave the second one on January 12th of 16, when he didn't realize he was being reported. Both times, both times, he told the police where he went, what he did, and the order he did it in. His statements are consistent in this regard. The state may try to compare the approximate times he gave for the places he went, compare it to the time stamps on the surveillance to try to make an argument that Edwin wasn't accurate from the times that he gave. I would encourage you to think back a month or two, or think back even a day or two, and try to remember where you were at an exact time. It's not as easy as it sounds. Edwin told the police where he went, told the police where he was, he told the police where he wasn't. Another thing I want to point out in this regard is that we can tell in watching that first statement that Edwin gave that there had been some discussion before the recording started. You can tell that from the way that Detective Cruz is, is questioning him about things that they already talked about. She was trying to pinpoint where he was at a specific place at a specific time. The second time, she and Finan went and talked to him at his work in January. They were really, in that interview, kind of pushing him as to whether or not he went to Cloverleaf. So to try to compare those two statements and indicate that they're somehow inconsistent is disingenuous. The problem is that when law enforcement, when Detective Cruz and Finan went back to talk to Edwin in January, they wanted him to give information that he did not have. Nothing in either of Edwin's statements suggests that he planned a murder with Dennis. Let's turn to the surveillance. And I want to focus your attention specifically on the Walmart surveillance. Did you see Edwin bopping around that Walmart buying toothpaste, cough syrup, honey, tea? The state wants you to believe that 35 minutes before committing a murder, Edwin was out buying toiletries and children's cold medicine? And you're going to have the receipt from that Wawa trip. And you're going to be able to see that at 7.03, those were the items that he purchased. That was not a man planning a murder. Let's talk about motive, or lack thereof. Edwin did not know Michael Black. Michael Black did not know Edwin. There is not one single text message between those two men. Edwin didn't text anyone, not even Dennis, about Michael Black. Not one text, not one recorded phone call, not one letter. There is nothing to suggest that Edwin had any reason to know or discuss anything about Michael Black. All the evidence that we heard, Dennis and Courtney, Courtney and Michael Black, Courtney and Michael Robinson, and Michael Robinson's wife Kelly and Michael Black, and Michael Black and Katrina, the buying and the selling of methamphetamine from the Wycliffs, all of that that's on the board. Edwin was not part of any of that, none of it. Every single witness, every single one that got on the stand agreed with me when I asked them that. Edwin was not part of that world. All Edwin did was work. He had a full-time job, he had a part-time job. Even Keith Wycliffe, when I asked him, said that the couple of times he saw Edwin, Edwin was always respectful to him. <coughs> Ms. 
this is why I asked you in my opening statement to remember that even though Edwin and Dennis are being tried together, you must consider them separately. They are separate individuals, they have separate circumstances, and they have separate lives. Now, in his opening, Mr. McKelvey mentioned that these two men are cousins, and that that supposedly establishes some uncompromising loyalty between the two. Ladies and gentlemen, the state has not established that there is some omerta or code of silence between these two men. And the fact that Edwin is a family man could not be misconstrued to suggest he's a murderer. I suggest to you that there is a complete lack of not only direct, but also circumstantial evidence against Edwin. And the reason there's no evidence against him is because he's innocent. I want to just talk for a minute or two about what the police did not do. We have, as Ms. Marquez has pointed out, many, many, many unanswered questions. And I want to just, again, spend a couple minutes talking about what the police did not do in a case in which you would expect a thorough investigation. Never searched Edwin's home. Never got a communication data warrant on Edwin's phone. I'm not going to get into too much of the crime scene evidence, but I would know in addition to the things that Ms. Marquesa has indicated, that sword in the house, never taken. The paper clutched in Michael Black's hand, never taken. What about Stephen Martinez, Benji? Because Edwin was ultimately arrested because, in part, he was seen on surveillance with Dennis the night of the murder. But Stephen Martinez, Benji, was also seen on surveillance with Dennis the night of the murder. Edwin was arrested in part because he had calls and text messages with Dennis before and after the murder. But Stephen Martinez, Benji, had multiple calls and text messages with Dennis before and after the murder. Edwin was arrested in part because Dennis referenced Edwin in some of the jail calls when speaking with others. Dennis also referenced Stephen Martinez, Benji, in some of the jail calls when speaking with others. In fact, Dennis actually spoke on the phone with Stephen Martinez. No recorded calls between Dennis and Edwin, though. The state is asking you to find Edwin guilty of murder as an accomplice and conspiracy to commit murder, but they never even interviewed Stephen Martinez? That makes no sense. When I asked Lieutenant Finan why, he said, well, we had information that Stephen went to Philly that night. There was a text message on Dennis's phone from Stephen at 7 a.m. the morning of November 10th that said, I'm still in Philly. That's the information that Lieutenant Finan had. Stephen Martinez should have been interviewed. He should have been investigated, and he was not. Who else wasn't interviewed? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Mark, Ms. Marquez has touched upon it, but Michael Robinson, an individual with clear motive, another man whose wife had an affair with Michael Black. And again, as she pointed out, not only did they not talk to him until last August of 18, never searched his residence, his vehicle, his phone. Allison Bertolino, the person that Dennis speaks to eight or nine minutes before that 911 call. Do you think she would have been a good person to talk to? Of course, save face, they call her last Friday after it was pointed out that she'd never been interviewed. And even then, they didn't ask her about that phone call that she had with Dennis nine minutes before the 911 call. Why do you think 
that after four months, the police <coughs> decided to charge Edwin Velasquez. Despite having all of the evidence they were ever going to have against him by the end of the year. Why do you think that is? I'll tell you why. I think. Solving a crime is often like putting together a puzzle <clears throat> without really knowing what that puzzle is ultimately going to be a picture of, without having that box top to go by. The problem in this case is that as soon as the police heard that 911 call, they believed that their puzzle was a picture of Dennis and Edwin. That's what they pictured. They considered no other alternatives, even when that puzzle started looking like someone else. Now, let's shift gears and just talk for a few minutes about the law. And Judge Delory is going to charge you uh, shortly on the law, I believe, after lunch, and the elements of each of the crimes that the state is required to prove. And again, we talked about this. The <coughs> state must prove each and every single element of every one of the crimes they've charged Edwin with beyond a reasonable doubt, highest standard in the law. And I want to point out a few things that are contained in the instructions that you're going to receive. First, in order for you to convict Edwin of being an accomplice to murder, you would have to find that the state has proved beyond a reasonable doubt four things. That Dennis Munoz murdered Michael Black. That Edwin aided or agreed or attempted to aid Dennis Munoz in the planning and committing of that murder. That it was Edwin's purpose to facilitate or promote that murder and finally, that Edwin had some criminal state of mind and the same criminal state of mind that is required by the person committing the crime of murder. So, in order to <coughs> find Edwin guilty, you would have to find that it was his purpose, Edwin's purpose to participate in the murder of Michael Black. That it was his conscious object that this murder be committed. It is not enough for the state to prove that he had just knowledge that the crime was going to be committed. And mere presence at the scene of a murder, and the judge will tell you this, mere presence at the scene of a murder does not in and of itself render a person a participant in that murder. In order to find Edwin guilty of conspiracy, the state would have to prove two things that Edwin agreed to aid Dennis Munoz in the planning or the commission or the solicitation to commit murder, and again, that it was Edwin's purpose to promote or facilitate the commission of the crime of murder. And the judge is going to tell you specifically that with regard to conspiracy, a family relationship with an alleged conspirator is not in and of itself enough nor is mere awareness of a conspiracy. These are important legal principles that I want you to listen for when you hear the judge <coughs> give you the, the charge on the law in this case. The state has not proven beyond a reasonable doubt any of the charges against Edwin. Edwin didn't aid or agree to aid or attempt to aid Dennis Munoz in planning or committing anything. The only thing Edwin was planning to do was to go to Florida the next day. And that was for a work job. Even if, even if some of you do think it was Edwin's band that went down that street that night, it was not. But even if you think that, that's still not enough in and of itself to prove him guilty of these charges. And at the end of the case, if you go back and deliberate this afternoon, if you are not firmly convinced that the state has proven its case against Edwin 
beyond a reasonable doubt, you must give him the benefit of the doubt and find him not guilty. I join this Marques in acknowledging that the death of Michael Black was an absolute tragedy. No one here disputes that. But it would also be a tragedy to convict an innocent man of a crime that he didn't commit, that he didn't plan, and that he didn't participate in. A conviction in this case also has lifelong consequences for Edwin. A man that you heard works two jobs <coughs> to support his wife and his children. A man that you heard has a reputation for being honest, peaceful, and law-abiding. And as Judge Lord will tell you, evidence of good character or reputation can, in and of itself, raise a reasonable doubt requiring you to go not guilty. On behalf of Edwin, I'm asking you to hold the state to its burden. Edwin Velasquez is innocent of these charges, so find him not guilty. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Swan. <laughs> right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll take our lunch break now. and we return from lunch, you'll hear the state's summation, and then you'll have the charge of the court. Lunch and plans will be back to start at 1.30. Discuss case duty research, come to any conclusions on electronic media devices. We'll see you at 1.30 for the state's closing. Thank you.